Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. And the hymn being spoken of here is Jesus, and this is what it says. And someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a certain rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? And he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And God said to him, you fool. This very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Pray with me. Lord, oh, to be rich toward you. That's, that's what we need. You feed our soul. You feed our spirit. You put us in touch with your great riches here in worship. May we not miss it. May we not miss it. Thank you for this opportunity. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Luke describes the situation that's going on here in chapter 12. At the very beginning of it, he says, there were so many thousands in the multitude, they were stepping on each other. It must have been just like chaos. So many people came to listen to Jesus, they were stepping on each other. That's not social distancing by a long shot. But that wasn't the tough part. The tough part was when a heckler broke out. One fellow yelled out to Jesus, hey, teacher, Tell my brother to divide the family inheritance. Well, you know, in the first place, hecklers in a sermon really aren't welcome. Not, not usually. And, but wasn't he doing what we all really want? <laughs> Don't we want a righteous judge? Somebody who says, tell the people around me I'm right and they're wrong. Tell them to do the right thing. Make them do what's right. But Jesus said... Man, I'm not appointed a judge or an arbitrator over you. And then he tells a story. Well, when Jesus tells a story, you just never do know where you are in the story. And that's the way Jesus' stories go. You have to listen. You have to listen. He tells a story about a farmer who had land that was productive. That's key. It wasn't throwaway land. It wasn't leftover land. It wasn't land that never produced. It was land that was productive. And on that land, he had barns. And whenever a farmer builds barns, he builds barns with imagination, imagining what the greatest yield of his crops will be. 
Well, he built barns big enough for the greatest yield, or at least what he imagined would be the greatest yield. If you build your barns too small, that means you've got to throw away a good bit of what's in the field. If you build your barns too large, it's, it, it's excess resources that you could have put somewhere else. He built his barns for what he thought would be his greatest yield, but it turned out his greatest yield was even more generous than he could ever imagine. God had poured abundance on him, and that's where the problem came. He said, well, I'll tear down my barns, and I'll build even bigger barns. And that night, he died. And then God speaks. Now, whenever Jesus tells a story where God does the speaking, it's time to listen. And this is what God says. He says, you fool. He doesn't call him evil. He doesn't say, oh, what a bad person you are. He says, you fool. This very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? That's the question God gives in this. Who will own what you have prepared? In other words, you can't take it with you. So what do you do? So what do you do? That's what I want to talk about this morning. You can't take it with you. So what do you do? Well, the first thing that I want to talk about is you live faithfully. That's what you do. So often we think about faith, and we think about faith in ourselves. And that if, if we just try a little harder and do a little better, we can have faith in ourselves, and we can only trust in ourselves. Jesus doesn't talk about faith in ourselves. Or we think about faith Maybe something a little deeper than that. There are different levels of faith. You know, faith in ourselves, that's, that's probably the most basic level. of Faith uh, maybe in, in a, a code or f- uh, faith in principles or a faith that comes in, in following a standard. Well, that's not what Jesus is talking about here either. Back in 1962, 14-year-old boy, Robert White, He wrote to the personal secretary of President John F. Kennedy asking his secretary, his personal secretary, if he could have an autograph of President Kennedy. The secretary's name was Evelyn Lincoln, and she sent back to Robert White a facsimile of the president's autograph but that had him hooked. And that started the relationship between Robert White and Evelyn Lincoln. It was a a relationship of correspondence. And she she thought how wonderful it was that a 14-year-old boy was that interested in everything that, that, that had to do with the president. So she would save things for him. Little documents that, that the president didn't want or need. Signatures, even doodles that the president made during meetings. When Robert White died, he had over 50,000 pieces of memorabilia. And it all started with an ask. It all started with a relationship. And that's how faith begins. Faith begins in relationship. A relationship with Jesus Christ. The way Revelations put it is, is, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and answers the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. That that relationship with Jesus is like a dinner where it's a friend that we sit and talk to, a friend that we walk with, a Lord that we listen to. That it's a relationship. And to live faithfully means that that our trust isn't in ourselves. Our trust isn't even in a standard. Our trust is that the risen Christ, that His Holy Spirit isn't, isn't off there somewhere, that He lives inside of us. And we trust that that relationship is what gives us the strength that we don't have. And that's what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 4.13. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He's not talking about a, a standard. 
He's not talking about a teaching. He's not talking about a code. He's talking about the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the risen Christ, the resurrected Christ living in him. And he's not just sitting out in a field, you know, writing off platitudes. Here's another platitude for you. He makes sure he's sitting in prison. If anyone knew the power of the risen Christ alive in his life as friend, as Lord, it was Paul. It was Paul. And if ever there's a time where we need that relationship of friend, of Lord, now's that time. There are about half the folks today that are looking to the future with hope. That, that this election has created a hope and, and, and that they can, they can look forward and, and that they're thankful and they're hopeful. And there are about another half of those uh, folks today that are hurt. And it, it, it's a time of confusion and unknowing. Whether it's in hope or whether it's in the unknowing. That we're, we're called to live a life that with a relationship with the risen Christ in these times. And that because that we're here in this time, who will own what we've prepared, the legacy of faith? Will that be the, the earmark of our lives or will we only trust in ourselves? With the legacy of faith and that relationship with Jesus Christ, will that be the, the earmark, the legacy in our lives, or is it only trust in a code? To be rich toward God means that we, we live faithfully, that we live faithfully. You can't take it with you, so live faithfully. The second thing that I want to talk about this morning, you can't. Take it with you, so love boldly. Love boldly. <laughs> Don Locker tells a story about a woman that was a member of his congregation. She was in her late 80s, and she was moving from her home to an assisted living facility. She had friends that lived there, and they were excited that she was going to move in. They had even prepared a banquet for her. It had balloons, had cake, there was food, and, and they had a place set aside for her at the table. Next to her, there was a a handsome, older gentleman, well-dressed. And uh, when she sat down, she, she couldn't quit staring at him. Well, she stared at him so much that he got a little uneasy. And then finally she said, I'm sorry, I qu can't quit staring at you. You look so much like my second husband. He said, oh, how many times have you been married? She said, once. Now that's bold, isn't it? That's bold. That's taking a risk. That's sticking your neck out. And that's the kind of love that Jesus calls from you and from me. In times like this, we have a tendency not to be bold. We have a tendency to love just me and mine. We have a tendency to, to do only what's needed, not to risk, not to stick our necks out. A little while back, I he used an illustration in a sermon, an illustration about a, a time where I saw a fellow sitting on a curb, and he looked like he was having a hard time, and I, I sat next to him, and I asked him if he was all right. Well, a member of this church said that he and his wife were, were driving, and, and they, they remembered that illustration when they saw a fellow sitting on a guardrail off the side of the road said that he didn't look like he was doing well at all. And that, that that illustration reminded them that they turned around and came back and went up to the fellow sitting on the guardrail and said, are you all right? And the man said, no, I'm not. I had a, a heart attack a little while back, and so I've been walking, trying to get my heart stronger and stronger, and, and I think I walked too far from home, and I don't have enough energy to get back. This member of our church said, well, can I give you a ride home? The man said, I'd love that. You're one of God's angels. 
Well, I don't know that we're called to be God's angels, but I do know that we're called to be God's light in the darkness. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Now's not a time to, to retreat. Now's the time to, to, to risk, to love boldly, to stick our neck out. Now's the time to let folks know that they, they matter to God and that they matter to us. Love boldly. Love boldly. There are folks that need to see and hear that they matter to God and they matter to us. That makes us rich. Rich, rich toward God. You can't take it with you, so love boldly. You can't take it with you, so love faithfully. And the last thing that I want to talk about this morning is you can't take it with you, so, so give. Give generously. When I was in the sixth grade, I wanted a dirt bike in the worst sort of way. I'll take that back. I wanted my father to buy me a dirt bike in the worst sort of way. <laughs> but the problem was, from the time I was a little bitty, I knew my father hated motorcycles. And I knew there was not one chance in the world that he would buy me a dirt bike. So I asked him, if I saved my money and saved enough to buy a dirt bike, could I buy a, a dirt bike? Well, the sp prospects of me Making enough money to buy a dirt bike in the sixth grade, we were just about zero, and my father said, sure. Well, I started looking for ways to make money, and I noticed there was this fellow in our neighborhood that uh, delivered newspapers house to house. I asked him if he was going to keep on delivering newspapers. He said, no, I've been thinking about quitting. So I went to my father. I said, would it be all right if I took over Dwight's job? delivering newspapers. He said, well, that'd be okay. Well, I delivered the Atlanta Journal-Constitution every day after school, five days a week, and Saturday and Sunday first thing in the morning. And I didn't work hard, and they wrote me a, a check and said, here you go. No, I had to, to collect. That's what it was called. Knock on the door. I had to nag is what I had to do. I had to go from door to door, knocking on the doors, nagging people that they needed to pay $3.35 a month for their newspaper. And more than once when I knocked on the door, I saw the light go out, heard the back door close and the car crank up as somebody ran from the paper boy trying to collect $3.35. But after a while, the money began to come in. And that's when my father taught me one of the most helpful things that I've learned in life. He said, you're starting to bring in a little bit of money. He said, you always need a little bit to spend. You always need a little bit to save, and you always need some to give to God. But if you start off with your spending, there'll never be enough to save, and there'll be, never be enough for God. There'll never be enough left over to save and for God. But if you start, if you start with giving God first 10%, There'll be enough to save, and you'll find there'll be enough to spend. Well, that's what I started doing back then in sixth grade. Well, it wasn't that hard. My dad provided food enough. He provided shelter enough, and it really wasn't that hard. It didn't start to get hard until I got my first real job I was pastor of a little church. I made the great sum of $7,000 a year. I qualified for food stamps and free cheese. And I thought, well, can I do it now? Can I set aside 10%? 10% for God and a little bit to save and a little bit for myself. Well, that was hard. But hard didn't come until I got... Three years later, I got a bigger church, and I made $12,000 a year. I can't tell you how hard the temptation was. That now I could, now I had enough where I could, I could buy some of those things that I'd been wanting for the past three years. That temptation doesn't come when times are hard. Temptation comes 
in abundance and prosperity. The temptation to tear down the barns and build bigger barns. The temptation for comfort. The temptation to give God the leftovers. That's when the temptation comes. And that's when it came for this man as well. This morning, we're starting our 2021 pledge campaign. And the church, like you at home, we have to budget for the coming year. And what we do in our budget is is we want to make sure that, that we don't give God the leftovers And because you've been generous, we've been able to to reach out in this this very difficult pandemic of a time and and reach out to families. Every week, we've been feeding over 200 families through my neighbor's pantry right here at the church, a thousand people a week. We don't want that to stop during the coming year. And we can't get it done if you give only leftovers. I want to invite you to give and to give generously. But not only that, during this hard time, we've had an opportunity to reach out with our mission partner, Hilma Cantu. Hilma has has been an important part of of linking us with, with students, children, that we can help learn to read Because English is their second language, she's helped us set up virtual learning. And not only that, our pet ministry, reaching out to those children where they can enjoy it in in our pet ministry. And volunteers here teach children to read in some of the local elementary schools to let folks know that they matter to God and that they matter to us. Can't be done with leftovers. So I want to invite you to give, give generously, and make a pledge to our 2021 campaign. Every week here in worship, we have a short time called our Community and Faith Moment. And during that moment, my hope is that you've seen time after time after time ways that that this church has changed lives in worship, in community, in outreach. And in those times, you've seen some of the things that have have been done with children and youth. That this place of community and faith has helped children and youth live a Christ-centered life. Let them know who they are in Jesus Christ. Let them know that they matter to God and that they matter to us. Leftovers won't do that. Every day, Here on this campus is a 12-step group. We have 25 12-step groups, seven days a week. Leftovers won't provide for them. 2021 pledge campaign is, is one of the ways you can give generously, and I invite you to do that. We've had worship here during this difficult time, and I'm thankful that we have. And because you've been generous, we've been able to reach out and and worship to people all across the country. We've even found that there's a pocket of folks in Ireland. Don't know how that happened, but there's a pocket of folks in Ireland that are listening and watching the worship services here. Because you've been generous, leftovers won't do that. We also have come to realize that that here in this place of community and faith where we we used to think of so much happening inside the building that we're having to to look more and more outside the building. And that this place has become like a beehive. That parents are bringing their children and riding bicycles in our parking lots and I'm thankful that they do. That in our green space called the commons, folks are out there all day every day in our pavilion, Bible studies. Small groups are meeting outside, and we need to extend more of those groups. We need to build an upper lawn, a place that can convert from small groups meeting to larger groups meeting outdoors. 
that this place of community and faith doesn't need to just be a place inside. It needs to be a place outside. And you know what? Leftovers won't do that. I want to invite you to, to pledge to the 2021 pledge campaign and to give and to give generously. That you can't take it with you, so give and give generously. You can't take it with you, so love and love boldly. You can't take it with you, so live faithfully. And living faithfully is a relationship with Jesus Christ, the risen Christ, not far off up in heaven, but right here today. And it may be that you've never... You've never said yes to that relationship with Jesus Christ. Our mission here at this church is to help people live a Christ-centered life. And we can't do it by trying to live according just to a standard or just the best that we can. That it's Jesus. Jesus, Christ in us, is the hope of glory, is what the Bible says. That that we can do thing, all things through Christ. Through Christ who, who lives in us. And I want to I wanna invite you in prayer to say yes to Jesus, to make his home in your heart this morning. Pray with me. Jesus, you know that this is a time of worship, a time where we, we look not to ourselves but to you. It's a time where you can change. You can change this world one at a time, beginning with us. And it's that relationship. Lord, live your life in that relationship that begins with us this day. There may be folks that, that have never said yes to you in a relationship. May they know your abundant grace. That when you gave your life on the cross, you did it to wipe away sin once and for all. That we can live as a forgiven people, not under guilt, not under shame, but free and forgiven. That with your power, we might live faithfully, we might love boldly, and we might give generously. I'm thankful for this church this church where through worship and community and outreach we help people live a Christ-centered life. May we continue to be that light that shines in the darkness. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith, and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online. My hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church. And we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life. And my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it.
Thank you for joining us.